All right, first chart. This is what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in IT, what's going on in business, because there's a lot of dynamics going on in the business environment today uh, that are changing right in front uh, of our face, frankly. We'll talk about that. Talk about what's going on with people that are running businesses because they affect what's going on uh, in IT. And we'll talk a little bit about how cloud relates uh, to all that. We'll talk about our strategy as a result of all that and why we're doing what we do. And then as uh, Chris mentioned, I'm gonna be joined by Mark Fasora, who is the CEO of Caesars Entertainment. I think you're gonna find that very interesting to hear from a CEO, first to hear from a CEO, second from a CEO outside of tech, uh, how Mark thinks about his business and the implication of all of the cloud transformation, investment in new applications and so forth as head on his company. And I think you'll find that uh, fascinating. And then I have some new predictions for what are going to happen in the IT business. Uh, I've made some of these predictions before, but I have new ones. Um, and I think the old ones were right, I think. We don't know yet because we haven't quite hit the entire time frame of the predictions, but we'll see what you think of the new ones we'll make. Okay, so that's what I'm going to try and do. First chart. The last five years of growth uh, around the world haven't been great. I mean, this is uh, 1.5 to 2.5 percent growth. This becomes important if you're uh, a CEO. Uh, if the market's only growing 2 percent, generally what that means is your company is going to grow 2 percent. If you want to grow faster than 2 percent, you got to take share from somebody. That's basically what it means. Taking share is tough. Taking share is tough. I got to get somebody else's customers while I don't lose any of mine. We'll talk about GDP because there's some changes going on right now in the macro economy as we speak, starting with the United States of America. 40% of that GDP growth, so take 2% on 75 trillion. I'm sure that's a number you thought about this morning when you woke up. But for, of 1.5 trillion, 40% of that GDP growth sits in one country, and that's China. So if you're CEO of a company, driving a company, that doesn't have exposure to China, you only get exposed to 60% of that GDP growth. So you got to find all that growth for your company out of that. In the context of IT, consumer IT is growing 20% and has been for a while. It's growing materially faster than B2B. Almost everybody in this room represents a business. We're all consumers too. We see what's happening with consumer IT, all the services, all the applications, all the devices, et cetera, et cetera, driving a lot of growth. It's driven now where consumer IT is roughly as big as business IT. By the way, if you're running a business, that's not necessarily a great thing. You now have customers innovating in many cases now and have been for a while materially faster than the companies have been. B2B IT has been roughly flat. Why? GDP's been low. Company growth has been slow. We'll talk about that in a second. The investment within it has been appropriately aligned to what you see in revenue growth uh, in the market. I always like to point out a couple companies down here at the bottom. If you think these companies that we're all in are immune to technological disintermediation, you know, I always say, how many of you went down over the weekend to Blockbuster and got a video? My guess is, Nobody, because they don't exist. And what if you went back just a decade ago, they were blowing and going. And they got disintermediated by, by what? Basically streaming. No need for what they have anymore. How many of you went to get a book at Borders over the weekend? They got disintermediated by Amazon. And you can go example after example of people that have been disintermediated technologically over this period of time, and it happens fast. Happens fast. Year 2000, Fortune 500. Today, half are gone. 50% gone in a relatively short period of time. And it could go faster. If you look at the pace by which it's going on, it's just amazing the way quality companies Leaders in some of their markets are gone. Next chart. This is what I was talking about. GDP has showing some signs of life 
estimates based now on the potentially 3 to 4 percent GDP growth. If that happens, that will be good for IT. That will be good for investment. Global GDP growth, and by the way, look at these numbers. I'm sure these numbers are fascinating to you. But just to, just to look at it, if you look at 2012, you got 74 trillion, and go to 2017, 79 trillion. While it sounds like a lot of money, $5 trillion, you look at one, two, three, four, five, six years to go get it, that's less than a trillion a year. So what's that compounded annual growth rate? Less than 2%. So you got one and a half percent, and people, that's why when you're sitting in businesses and you wonder why IT budgets aren't growing, this is why. It starts with there's less commerce around the planet, less growth in commerce around the planet than there was in the previous decade. Okay, now, if this is true, that's why I have it in gray, and you see 79 go to 84 in 2018, and it may not sound like much, 1.5 to 3.4, or 3 to 4, but when you put it against 80 trillion, it's a lot of money. And all of a sudden, $5 trillion of growth shows up. Guess what happens? It gets reinvested back into the business. So if you thought about the worldwide economy just like a company, this is a company now that's driving growth. If this happens, certainly U.S. corporate tax cuts will, will help. The job growth, you can't help, this is not a political statement, you can't help but look at these numbers that come out, I read them, and job growth is impressive. Wage growth underneath that is impressive. The U.S. economy, productivity, by the way, the U.S. being the biggest, everybody know, 20 trillion of that 75 trillion is right in this country. And the productivity of the American worker is at an all-time high all-time high creating new jobs, and that's happened really in the last 18 months as a phenomenon. So if this, and you get improved growth in the EU, for those of you who don't know, the EU is the same size as the US from a GDP perspective. So, and they have been growing, well, I may be generous just even using the word growing with the EU. It's been very flat. Banks have taken a long time to recover, and they're not spending. They're cutting IT as a result. So if you see growth back in the EU, this whole picture looks a whole lot better, and that's going to be great for our industry and for all of us. All right, next chart. And by the way, I'm sure I went through that fast blizzard of numbers, but I just want to get you this context of why what's happening in IT is happening. And a lot of it starts just from the macro economy. Now, this creates other problems. So let's talk about that. You gotta grow revenue, you gotta gain share. While you do it, there isn't a CEO in the world that's gonna bet on that GDP growth without some sort of hedge. And what's that hedge usually? Reducing expenses. Most CEOs, once the last, by the way, I'm sure you all know, every, you know eight, I think it's about 40% of CEOs don't last 18 months. Doesn't sound good, right? And I'm on borrowed time. So if you wind up, <laughs> if you wind up in a situation where you're not where you're lowering spend, it's really the hedge. If we only have one and a half percent GDP growth, why do those of you in IT feel like people are cutting expenses? Because they are. Because they're simply trying to hedge their bet to get more cash flow. Now another fundamentals come up. We'll talk about that in a second. Which is now you got to manage risk too. Used to not be that way. Yeah, there was always some management of risk. But now corporate reputational risk has become a big deal. What we in IT would think of as getting hacked. This is not a good thing if you're a CEO. Getting hacked, you can write that down. If you get hacked, generally not good. And, and when you go to the board, you're in the board meeting, and you say, we got hacked, there may not be another meeting. Okay, it's, it's, it's that sensitive a subject, and we'll talk about that in a second. So managing risk, big deal, just as big a deal in some cases, improving cash flow, lowering spend, and growing revenue. By the way, you have a lot of people out there trying to change business models on you as we speak. We'll talk about that in a second. But really, the way you can change the business, change your business model, develop brand new products. By the way, particularly in our industry, 
Ain't easy to develop new products if you're on an 18-month cycle, and that's your tenure. The average CEO, by the way, lasts four years. So you want to innovate your way through new products? Tough, tough on a four-year basis. Deliver better service, services, or in the end, just build better customer experiences. Chris talked about this a little earlier about the opportunity to deliver a better customer experience, and that is a key way to differentiate yourself and take share. All right, let's go to the next chart. How am I doing on time? Am I too slow? Okay. You never know. I already talked a little bit about this. This is the pressure on the CEO, and I, I'm very empathetic uh, to CEOs, um, but I can tell you it's, I, I, we, we hire a lot of young people into our company. Uh, amazing young talent we get off the college campus. And almost assuredly, I get the question uh, from, from these great young people, how do I become a CEO? I really want to become a CEO. And I always start with, I'm not sure you do, but think about it. It's not the easiest thing in the world. First of all, the average tenure is only 18 quarters. That's four and a half years. A lot of people don't make it 18 months. Why? Most aren't ready to be in the job. Not ready. And what happens when you get in it is sometimes the job gets on top of you before you get on top of it. And if that happens to you, you're in real trouble. And that's the issue I'm talking about, the pressure that's growing. It's very tough out there when you've got an environment with 1.5% GDP growth and a bunch of very thoughtful people on your board saying, you know, I think I've got a couple of great ideas for you. Grow your revenue. Reduce your expenses. It's the end of the meeting. It's great. Thank you for coming. It's very thoughtful. Much harder to do than say. Much harder to do than say, particularly against the economic backdrop I just showed you. IT becomes now a real problem because what's happened in IT? People have not invested in it for the last decade. So what happens? We got old stuff out there, old computers, old applications, applications 20 years old. 20 years old, by the way, 20 from 2018, 2017. Bob, you could figure that out. Yeah, very good. That's uh, very good. 1997 or 8, pre-internet, pre-social, pre-mobile, pre-everything. Prehistoric in the context of IT, <laughs> right? So very old stuff. So now you got this old stuff. You got guys like disruptors showing up. If you're in the hospitality business, you got Airbnb showing up. They're disrupting your business with a brand new business model. Very attractive business model. No employees of consequence. That was a wrong thing to say. Very few employees. <laughs> very productive employees. Very productive few employees. And they've disintermediated an industry. Lyft, you can go on, and you all know all this. But now you have disruptors, you've got low GDP growth, and you've got old systems. Let's go to the next chart. Security. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is a big deal. You know, as I said, most of the boards that show up will tell you, listen, I've read a story about a company that got hacked. I don't want to get hacked. Are we going to get hacked? All this stuff. And, and the reality is today I would tell you that as big a deal as secure, or as big as a topic as security is, nobody still takes it seriously. And there'll be a day, and I want to predict it, when something happens, something material, and this will become materially bigger. I mean, look what happened post 9-11. Right now, what you're at in the phase where awareness is up, people are talking, people still aren't acting. I'll give you a simple statistic. How long does it take? Have you ever heard this story? We'll talk about it in a second. In fact, let's go to the next chart. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you this story a little bit, and then I'm going to weave the security into that. This is Highway 101 and Highway 280. These are the two highways that flank the Silicon Valley, where I normally am, where it's 6.20 in the morning, very early in the morning. Let me tell you a story. 1988, many people here around in 88? The number one, it's a pop quiz. Does anybody know who the leading microprocessor company was in 1988? 
company called IBM, the leading operating system company, IBM, the leading database company, Chris, guess Oracle. <laughs> Wrong. IBM. There was a thing called management tools at the time, not middleware. You know who the leader in that was? Boy, you guys, I'm telling you, I asked for energy. This isn't what I was looking for. Any guess? Very good. It's a great crowd. Um, I'm going to invite you guys to come to my next uh, talk. So anyway, these guys had a virtually, had basically a, a vertically integrated stack, optimized to work together. Customers didn't love their procurement leverage on IBM. Department of Justice stuck their nose into it. <sighs> Some concessions were made. I don't really know I wasn't at IBM, but somewhere in there during that time frame, their technology leadership began to wane. These two highways became littered with technology companies. The microprocessor leadership shifted from IBM to Intel. Intel. Operating, operating system leadership shifted to Sun, Microsoft, Red Hat. Database leadership shifted to Middleware leadership to Thank you very much for it. By, by the way, good points. While well, a couple other names were mentioned, that also was a phenomenon of the time. There wasn't just one. There was a second, third, and fourth player in each of these segments. And what happened? Procurement organizations had a field day. This was a field day. I'm going to buy from all these guys. I'm going to buy, get server companies. I'm going to beat their brains out. Operating, so everybody beat their brains out, and we'll, we'll make all this stuff go together. We'll kludge all this stuff together with our IT staffs. And then a new industry evolved called systems integrators. Didn't exist at the time. Became a $200 billion industry. You even see sponsorships of places, of events like this. It's great. And it really was because what became was lots of complicated Lego sets. Dial back now 20 some years or dial forward 20 some years, and what do you got? Extremely complicated, heterogeneous systems that have been glued together over the course 20, 25 years. It starts with it's even hard to find out what you got. Tell me all the versions of everything I have in inventory. When somebody tells me, this poor Equifax guy who got up there in front of Congress, and I, I love the question from a congressman who said, why is it so hard? Why are you people so stupid that you couldn't patch? Let me start with the first answer. It's really hard, it turns out. And it really turns out to be hard when you have all this heterogeneity. So what we've gotten now is a very diverse, very vertically disintegrated ecosystem of Lego sets that have been glued together over the past 20 to 25 years, supplemented by, with IT organizations supporting it, supplemented by what's now become a huge SI industry. It's very expensive, it's very complicated, and to be very blunt with you, difficult to secure and possibly dangerous. By the way, the expense, back to the point of how much of the maintenance of IT budgets, there you have the reason. It's a cost a lot of money just to keep these things running. Let's go to the next chart. And that's one of the reasons at the core why this cloud is such a big deal. This is not just a technology shift. It's a generational shift. It isn't just about technology. It's about business models. It's about strategy. It's about flipping this model totally around. Companies cannot sustain the status quo. It is a non-sustainable business model that we have today. Why will this change? It costs less to do this. 
You get more innovation without putting it on your IT staff or having to pay for it in the third party market. It is more secure. By the way, guess what we can do patching wise? You're gonna hear about autonomous database. Uh, you know, we'll talk about uh, autonomous stuff a little later. But now, when a database gets patched, by the way, if you don't know, it takes our customers months to get our patches through their ecosystem. Why? It's hard. It's hard. I don't want to give you a time frame, but less than a year, more than six months to patch our systems when we release a patch. Because they sit on different operating systems and different servers, there's different versions, I can go on and on. In the cloud, guess what? Patched immediately. Patched immediately. It's more secure. The data is encrypted. I mean, I can go on and on. Cost less, more innovation, more secure, and now you're going to start seeing, we'll talk about this in a second too, AI integrated into the technologies. More emerging technologies, and I don't believe AI will become a thing. I believe it will become a feature integrated into everything. Very different strategically. This is not a question about whether this is going to happen. It's only, and so when I do these predictions, I don't question if. It's only a question of calibrating the win. Because it isn't just about the tech. We've had things in this industry that are just about technology. This is about everything to do with macroeconomics, business model strategy, and technology. All right, next chart. OK, uh, this is a little bit about us. I'm not going to, you're going to have a lot of people up here telling you about Oracle strategy but it really has been us building the most complete set of SaaS applications. Chris talked about it, one data model, all of the applications sitting on that data model, a complete set of PaaS services, um, and the next generation of infrastructure for all of it to run on, all of it driven by AI, all the way from the database to AI driven into the applications, all of this showing up in every generation we do it. And it's important that these all work together because in the end, I don't think you're gonna trade your complexity on premise, that mess I talked about, for a mess in the cloud. I think you're gonna trade the mess on premise for something materially simpler in the cloud. And so it's important, I do not believe there are gonna be 50 vendors. I'm not sure there's gonna be 15. I think there are gonna be a handful of people that can actually do what's, what's described here the ability to really vertically integrate and optimize, and still with enough choice in the market that gives you some amount of leverage uh, across the ecosystems, but very few ecosystems that can do what's described, what you're gonna hear over the next period of time here. Okay, I think from there, we're gonna transition. Let me get back to my seat. And let me introduce the CEO of Caesars, uh, Mark Frisora. And Mark, come on up. Give Mark a big hand. How are you? Good to see you. All right. Great. The crowd's riveted. They are. Yeah, I they're riveted. Yeah. They're riveted. By the All way, right. Mark well, is from Las Vegas. He's on the same time zone that I'm on. So any energy again from the crowd, most appreciated. Um, maybe we start, Mark, just, you know, people have various, you know, I don't know, views of what, when they hear Caesars, what Caesars is. Maybe you could start just talking about Caesars and, you know, what the business is all about today. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, thanks for being here this morning. I guess uh, we have 47 casinos or integrated resorts around the world, we're on four continents. Um, we're the world's largest, actually, ticket holder for four and 5,000 seat theaters. Um, we do about $10 billion in revenue. Um, our margins over the last three years have improved about 800 basis points. And uh, we just got out of bankruptcy in October. Um, so That's a good thing, right? It's a really good That's thing. Good thing yeah. and, um, and so now we're all about growth. We've been about efficiency for a lot of that time. Our um, our labor actually is about 10% more efficient, and our marketing expenses are also down around 10%. So we've uh, been very, very focused on just trying to lean out the organization, and now our, our growth agenda is 
turned the corner. We've got about $2 billion of cash on the balance sheet, a strong balance sheet, and pretty good cash flow. The business model is very good at generating cash. In the gaming industry, you might imagine that. So, uh, so it's exciting times for us, and we're looking for technology to transform the business right now. By the way, I, I think what everybody would like to know, how really good are my odds when I walk into a casino? Well, the house always wins. You know that, Mark. Yeah, so yeah. the longer you stay with us, the more money we make. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I've, I've always figured that whatever there's the most of are the worst odds for me. Right, right. So your best odds in the house are blackjack and craps. Um, and if you're a skilled player, we make about 3% on you. If you're unskilled off the street, we make 27% off of you. So uh, it's quite a difference. Just 20 See, rules if, of blackjack. If you've got you know. nothing out of anything, you got, you got that. <laughs> so when, That's I'm, the I'm, only thing they're gonna remember about what I had to say. No, so. it's great. <laughs> unskilled, 27%. Yeah, unskilled, that's correct. Yeah, and, uh, and probably as most people in the room, as it relates to gambling, you're talking about a skilled yeah. gambler. That's right, that's right. And you should always get up from the table the moment you start to lose. Yeah. Don't stay with a bad luck dealer, right? And if you win and you start to lose, get up again. But it's amazing how many people keep staying there and losing. I oh, yeah. just can't Which is good it. for you. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why there's free drinks and everything else. That's right. You get yeah. free drinks. We'll just keep pouring them in. Down yeah. the thing. I just get keep it. Going. Yeah, it's a great. Make model. you happy to stay. Yeah. I wonder if we could. Anyway, let's go on. <laughs> so you're, you're so you're roughly three years uh, into that's the role. Right. That's right. Three years. This is your third CEO. It is. Job as yeah. well. So so you're a very experienced hand. Yes. Um, three years into the role. What would you say you've accomplished? What are you thinking about doing next to grow the business? Well, we have a, a branding and licensing opportunity. We have 20 brands besides Caesars Palace. There's Paris, there's Cromwell, there's Harrah's, Bally's, World Series of Poker. And so the idea is to take those brands and start to br use them with, uh, in hotel applications. We have a lot of developers that would love to use our brand. They spend the capital. We give the brand, we manage the property, and it's a very similar model to like Hilton or Marriott, but we've never done it. So it's a big opportunity in an asset light way to get the franchise out there, get the name out there, and then use our Total Rewards membership program. Well, well. so let's talk a little bit about IT. So, I mean, and you're, you're not a programmer by trade. No. No, no. Mm -hmm. never wanted to be a programmer? No, I didn't. No, no I can't say I did. I understand. So. Yeah, yeah. I completely get it. Um, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, though, what you think of IT. You've got a big IT department. How do you think about technology and, and the role it plays in the context of your strategy? Well, first of all, data is really important for us. And uh, we have a pretty sophisticated data analytics department. So it's always been important. Um, we have 150 people there and about 20 data scientists. And so we've had a very high competency in CRM. However, having said all that, our, our systems basically are old legacy systems, about 40 years old, as you mentioned on your slide earlier. And uh, the whole industry is really pretty bad and not digitized, no one's in the cloud, everything's homegrown, parts are on eBay. I mean, it's pretty pathetic. So, <laughs> so at the end of the day, <laughs> At the end of the day, um, we decided, you know, about I mean, 40 years ago, is old. I mean, that's, that's right. That's that is old, really old. Yeah, yeah. They're old systems. I think, uh, I think Vegas is only 50 years old, so, I mean, it's pretty old. Yeah. So um, we find that um, if we look at the, what your capability is and, and how you guys have invested so much money in the cloud, um, and yet you have maturity and understanding the apps really well, we partnered with you, as you know, just a couple of years ago to really try to digitize our business, get all of it in the cloud, and leverage that at the customer level. So today you can't go into a casino and plug in your device and get automatic points, understand what's going on. So that's because a lot of things have to go on behind the scenes before we get real-time data. So we started off with our general ledger and our accounts payable, um, ERP program basically, and um, you know, totally got that done last year, and you guys were incredible on it. We have no complaints. I know I just pulsed uh, my whole organization this weekend and um, gave you guys kudos for not only taking care of the program and the implementation of it, but the platform itself actually has some advanced analytics in it. It's got some AI in it, so, uh, so we're leveraging that. 
And then the second piece is the HCM, and right. as you and I know, that we were going to do that at the same time, the human right. capital management piece. And having those platforms together, again, gives us tremendous capability with labor, real-time information, and then the efficiency. It saved us a lot of, a lot of money. Right. We, our audit fees are down about 20% right now. Our, uh, we had about... Uh, 20% well, we reduction, 20 reduction audit, audit fees. And then we also had, uh, you know, we had 2,000 spreadsheets we close the books with every month, and they're all gone. Uh, we had a, a lot, I won't even tell you how many thousands of journal entries we made, but they're down 95%. And then we're saving money at the end of the day. Our, our old system was costing us about, uh, I don't know, say $15 million a year to maintain. This is two to three million a year. So on just the general ledger and accounts payable piece. So again, we're thrilled. I mean, it was a, it's a great program. You mentioned something really interesting, Mark, because I remember you were going down a financials track and an HR track. That's correct. And we talked uh, sometime in the spring, I think, and we talked about bringing them together, and you did. Right. You decided in the exactly. end to bring them together. Can you talk a little bit about why it made sense to bring those two projects sure. together? I mean, yes, because Obviously, when you look at whether it's the payroll system, the talent management system, we now have everything online. So anything from orientating the employee, onboarding, to exiting the employee, the environment is so much safer, so much secure, it's faster, it's easier to use for the users. So we study our end users and we take all kinds of SLAs and surveys on them. And uh, again, all the survey results on, on just the finance piece are huge, but we know when we get the HCM system fully implemented, which will be at the end of February, we know that's also going to be a huge win for all the users. And even you know, when we try to onboard employees, um, it'll be very, very sophisticated for us to be able to train them the way we'll be able to and, and keep tabs on every employee in the company. Right. So it's very interesting because we advocate that a lot to folks about bringing together the whole back office. Some do, some don't, but I think you were, when you made the decision was about the time you've started to see companies do that on a more regular basis. Yeah. Um, okay, so tell me a little, what's next uh, based on you know, where you're at uh, now? We talked about HCM going live in February, uh, GL live now. Uh, what, what's next? Procurement's big for us. So I know that supply chain is something we're looking at with you guys for the future. Um, something because it's obviously we buy a lot of everything, um, a lot of alcohol especially, um, yeah. and, uh, and a lot of food, a lot of food product. And so um, we don't have a good integrated supply chain system. And then there's a piece, it's another financial uh, piece for us yet to do with you guys. And, uh, and then we, we, we're right now, probably through the end of February, we'll be about 60% of the way yep. digitized. We'll be, uh, our plan is by 2020, 100% of the way in the cloud. And uh, again, I, I, I know that um, having these standardized systems and you guys updating the soft, the apps often, yes, and it's just done automatically, yes. and it's just a very, very, again, efficient, real-time system that you're silly not to take advantage of. And yeah, you'll never, you'll never be writing features again. It'll all come automatically. Right. Uh, it's, it's just great. Um, now, let's talk about data. How important, you talked about data and you know, basically knowing who is an experienced gambler, who's an inexperienced gambler, but how important is data in your business and how do you think about it to maximize the customer experience? Well, for us, again, we don't have the immediacy of the data available. And one of the things that the uh, Oracle systems have allowed us to do is communicate with our casino marketing system now. We have interfaces so that on the computer screen, you know, we see the information real time. It integrates. You know, we, have, I, we can tell you, if you give us 24 hours, everything you want to know about um, a customer, when they were last here, how much money they spent, what's their you know, net win or net loss over a lifetime. We have a lot of data, but it wasn't real time. And yeah. so enable us to get that. It also, again, when we look at some of the advanced analytics in the package along with the AI, and we start anticipating, if you will, and predicting behavior that allows us to focus our reinvestment in those customers in a much smarter way. Yeah. So. Mark, anything else that uh that uh, you'd like to say to the group? No, I would just say, I guess the only thing from a, from a CEO's perspective, um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of systems changes and, and Mark's been involved in some of those with me as well in different roles. Um, it's so important that if you're going to do a system change, you don't customize any of it. Zero customization and you will get this 
uh, complete big, big wine from every single department and every single part of your business to customize. And even when you say don't customize, they still do. And so I, I think with the Oracle system that you know, we have here today, right. it's a great example of no customization. The implementation went flawlessly. We didn't have one hiccup. I mean, the first month's closing was perfect. Uh, so uh, again, I can't preach enough about this, that customization is in fact something that's a no-no and you should never do. And I have an example of where it went really bad um, from <laughs> yeah, my history. We don't I won't want to say more about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but in, in fairness, it, without going into where it was, um, it was an Oracle highly, highly customized ERP mm -hmm. that was, uh, and you had multiple of them. We did. We have three different businesses, and they all had to go through it. And yeah, it was a, a train wreck because we allowed customization, which we shouldn't have actually. So yeah. it was it's our fault uh, on the whole thing. The whole project was really spec'd out the wrong way. But, but uh, again, there was a feeling at the business unit level that we had to have unique characteristics on the ERP system for the different businesses, and that the business was so unique that we had to have it. But as I said, at the end of the day, that's just really a bunch of um, BS, really. So, yeah. 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 It's, a, it's so true. I mean, it just, uh, it's interesting because the stat I'd give you is that there's 20,000 or so Oracle ERPs out there on premise. And almost all of them have been customized. There's now over almost 6,000 of the types of systems that Mark's talking about, and they're all the same code base. And yet, of the 20,000, all of them have been customized to a degree. So there's actually more runtime on the systems you're on mm. than even on the older generation yeah, of ERP. It's, it's more of expensive to maintain. It's very uh, difficult. There's very difficult. Uh, yeah, a thousand things that go with that that are wrong, you know. So, yeah. but yeah. So we we're like I said, we're excited to see what's going to happen next um, with the system changes, and I don't think we even know our full capability. And right. I guess from my perspective. Um, I'd love to see from you guys what new products you're coming out with, uh, what new things that we can use that can help us in our business yep. model. I know I'm not saying I'm, I know what that all is, but. Well, I mean, listen, I think you're going to see from us, you're going to hear, these folks here are going to hear about databases moving to becoming autonomous, which is mind-blowing. I mean, to, I think, people in the industry, it's historically when you've had a database and you've got applications that you described as homegrown, you know, many customers have homegrown apps. By the way, the leader in, in applications is Other, which is mostly homegrown. And um, those sit on databases that have lots of labor, lots of DBAs, people that tune them all the time, um, et cetera. And as these databases move to the cloud, they're automatically tuned, they're automatically patched. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things that have required that we're going to be more secure, they're going to perform better. Um, it's going to be a huge change, I think, point one. Point two, I think you'll see in the apps uh, more and more machine-to-machine -machine or artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. things that uh, instead of you doing the work, the computer will do it for you. Your HR applications, when you start hiring people, the ability for the computer to do all of the analysis about who has the best fit, who's likely to be the most productive employees, all of that. Um, the, that, that's the way you'll see AI integrated. It'll be integrated into the apps as use cases as opposed to um, just say, hey, send some data up to AI in the cloud. Right, right. Security, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, is a big deal. And, um, and you talk about CEOs, basically, when they're hacked, they're dead. But yeah. I guess the point... I, I don't know if I use that word, but... Well, I mean, you know, hack, if they're hacked, they could lose yeah. their job. I, I think it's a very... Um, People, CEOs are undereducated about cybersecurity. Yeah. They're undereducated about security in general. We get a lot of presentations from technology folks that need to dummy it down for someone like me. I mean, you can't, you can't talk in what I call tech speak. Um, and I think, from my perspective, anyways, I've never had anyone really call on me and explain to me why their systems are better than anyone else's from a security standpoint. You guys sell it well, and I understand why the security right. is better, but I, I think you can't oversell that enough. Yeah. And uh, I think the pitch boards are panic-stricken by it, as you know, and, yeah. and but everyone sits around the boardroom, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm familiar with it. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, <laughs> it, 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 I think the, the, 
the challenge with it is it's a, it's a field day for vendors. A lot of people sell in network security. You know, I try to tell people nobody is trying to steal your network. You know, everybody wants your data. And, and so it's the data they're after. And so securing the data is, is job one. And I mean, the chances of you fighting the bad guys without going into all the details of the bad guys versus us fighting the bad guys, we have a big advantage. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, the, it, back to the difference of configurations I was talking about, if you heard it earlier, there's hundreds of configurations of computers and systems in these companies. In, in our cloud, for example, there's one. Mm. We have one computer with one version, one version of the operating system, one version. Of, so our job's just infinitely easier from, uh, from the get-go. And then we're able to, to encrypt all of the data. So even if you got it, you don't get a, you don't really get at, at the data. So it's it, this patching problem. I, I, I could spend an hour on patching. Although patching is so complicated because of these heterogeneous systems. I was with a, a, a bank CEO who actually asked me about just patching. Mm. And his board was same thing. The board was telling him, you know, we're terrible at patching because they patch in four months. And I was, I hated to tell him, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. And so the ability now to get that problem transferred to us, and his point was very simple. I really want to, if I have to go in front of US Congress because we got hacked, I want to tell them that I did exactly what Mark Hurd and <laughs> Oracle told me to do. That's right. Because that's a lot better defense than I'm four months in patching. Because right. they won't care that I'm a little faster. And so I, I think you're right. We have to do as an industry a better job not just selling point products, but talking strategically about right. you know, how we can help secure all of this. Because it's, yeah. it's a tough job. Yeah. It's a tough job. It is. All right, Mark, yeah. thank you so thank much. Thank you. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Good seeing you. All right, good to see Take you. Care. Thank you. Okay, I'd again like to thank Mark. 27% uh, for the unskilled gambler. That's going to stick. That's going to stick uh, with me. All right, how am I for time? Okay, good. All right, I'm going to give you just a couple of incremental predictions of what's going to happen in our industry. I'm going to do it relatively quick. Can we flash the first chart up? So this is what I... No, go, go back. Go back. OK, that's the right chart. I can't see what's behind me. Um, all right, this is what I previously said. Let me just go through. 80% of the production apps that are in the industry, like what Mark's talking about, are going to be in the cloud. There'll be two SaaS suite providers that'll have 80% market share. This is by 2025. Number of corporate-owned data centers will have decreased by 80%. By the way, the good news is I did these like two years ago. And most of these have proven to be on the way to happening. The only thing I'd say so far that's been wrong is I may have been too slow. 80% of IT budgets will be spent on cloud services. 80% of IT budgets will be spent on business innovation. 20% on maintenance, flipping that business model that I talked about uh, however long it was uh, ago. Uh, all enterprise data really will be stored in the cloud. Even if you have an old on-premise application, you'll look for it to be hosted uh, in the cloud. All dev tests will be in the cloud. Nobody will be doing dev tests uh, on-premise. Uh, enterprise clouds will be the most secure place for IT processing, just for the example of what you got to hear from somebody other than, other than me. Now, I would just... Uh, uh, summarize all this as to take, let me just take one, one objective here, data centers. Last year in the U.S., about 15% of the data centers closed. About 15%. So that would give you some context of, and I'm sure you all feel this in your companies, people trying to figure out how to consolidate systems, find ways to get, get cost out, again, because budgets are tight, one way to do it. Offload work into the cloud, closed data centers. 15% closed. I would tell you at this rate, I'm slow. I'm slow. On, on, this is, by the way, two years in a row, we saw 12%, then 15%. So at that rate, that's going to be at 2021, 2022, as opposed to 2025. Uh, about 20% of the apps are now in the cloud, to give you some ca uh, uh, calibration of that. Of that, of that prediction. By the way, when I made it, it was like three. So that would give you an idea of just how fast 
this all this movie. Doesn't mean it's happening for everybody. There's a little bit of a difference in a regulated industry versus a non-regulated industry. There's a little bit of difference depending on what geography you're in, how data sovereignty may affect you. There's a whole set of variables here. That said, the trends are sort of uh, uh, indisputable. All right. That's what I did already said would happen. Let's go to some new stuff. All right. Next, this is uh, what I think will happen. Uh, more than 50% uh, of all en enterprise data will be managed autonomously and be more secure. So we've announced this autonomous database. You're going to hear more about that uh, today. But, but I think you're going to find that as this comes out, it isn't just going to be about security, just about cost, just about performance. It's going to be about all of it. You know, there's very few times I can get something to run better, run faster, be cheaper and more secure while I do it. This will do that. 50% of enterprise data autonomy. Even highly regulated industries will shift 50% of their production workloads to the cloud. 90% of all enterprise applications will feature AI capabilities, just like what I was talking about with, with Mark. We'll talk about that. Top ERP vendor in the cloud will have more than half the market. I did say before, two SaaS suite companies, and I still feel the same way. I know who one of them is, I just don't yet know who the other is. And, and it's interesting because two years ago, I actually thought some way somebody else would emerge. Market's too attractive. Uh, I see Thomas there who's coming on next, Thomas Curry. Thomas and I would talk about this all the time. Something will happen, and to be very blunt with you, it just hasn't. It just hasn't. So um, I do believe the top ERP vendor will, uh, by the way, the top ERP vendor all in today has about 23% of the market. So it's very interesting to be the top and to have 23. How many markets does a leader have 23? Almost none, okay? I believe that will fix itself in this market for the reasons that Mark described and the leader will have more than half the market. All right, let's go to the, I think I've got a little bit more data here. This is simply about 50% 50, 50 of the enterprise data will be managed autonomously. I won't take you through all of this data, but basically look at the TCO. This is a three-year TCO, and it basically is 50%. So, you know, listen, if you're interested in saving money, this is a good thing. If all you did was save money, though, I don't think that alone will drive this, the velocity and speed to bring this to market as fast as it will. It costs less money and it runs faster. And we actually on this database offer you, uh, that we're releasing, offer an SLA that would only give you 30 minutes of downtime per year. Planned or unplanned, total. Less downtime, more secure, less expensive, performs better. Sounds good. I, I, I may be, 2020, I think, is probably right. I've, d I've erred now on the side of I think I was too slow two and a half years ago. So I'm probably here trying to rectify that by saying this stuff is moving faster than I thought, and I think you'll see this occur. Next, next chart. This is really still on the same thing. Yeah, I'll give you an example. 85%, so I think this is an interesting well, it's an interesting stat. It's as interesting as the 3% and the 27% of skilled and unskilled gamblers. 85% of exploits had a patch available for more than a year. Now think about that when you're testifying in front of Congress, if you're a CEO. What happened? Well, it's a long story. You know, it's complicated. Or IT. You, you can imagine how it is. None of this is good. Anything that starts with it's a long story doesn't help. 74% of organizations take three months to patch. And by the way, I'm telling you, there's people way out there at 12 months, 13 months, 14 months to get some of this done. And by the way, I'm not, uh, I've, I've had people come to me saying, oh, you don't think patching is important, customers don't think it's important. No, that is not my message. It's hard. It's hard because of all this heterogeneity. And this gets resolved in this whole move to autonomous. The labor goes away, the risk goes away, the speed goes away of getting this work done. Next chart. 
Uh, even regulated industries want to move to the cloud. They have some regulator who may or may not know much about IT. Regulator says, and unfortunately, how many people here have been in a meeting with a regulator about moving to the cloud? There you go. I can tell you, I had a great meeting. Uh, I've been in a few, when, and I saw this, I was talking with this guy who was a regulator who explained to me that if the computer was in this room, it was okay. But if the computer's over here in this other room, it's not okay. And I found that very interesting because it's sort of not relevant, but it was to this guy. And so I said, let me explain this, let me make sure I understand. Here's a wall, the computer is on this side of the wall, and by the way, the Oracle data center and the customer share a wall. Share a wall. On one side of the wall, no good. On the other side of the wall, okay? Exactly. So it makes no sense. So, uh, okay, that's what we'll do. And that really drove us to developing this thing called cloud at customer, which was to bring all the benefits of the cloud, all of this patching, all of this lower cost, bring all of that to the customer, but deal with the fact that you might have to have it in those vanishing data centers for a while. I believe this will solve itself over time in terms of this regulatory environment as regulators get more aware and more educated, but this is a way to get through it today by us bringing our cloud to a customer's data center. This will accelerate regulated industries, banking, healthcare, et cetera, moving faster to the cloud. Next chart. Yeah, this is really AI. And this really is the opportunity as I described, I don't think this is readable. Is it readable? Yeah, okay, uh, not for me. So I, I think this is gonna be what you're gonna see, which is really applications with features added to it that give, it diff give the application different capabilities. Our head of HR wants to hear about recruiting, not about AI. You know, people, when you talk about supply chain, want to talk about products. They want to talk about moving inventory. Let's see if I can get down here. Maybe I can participate reading this a little bit. Because there's good, there's good use cases here. I want to find better options to distribute goods, optimizing freight. But again, if I tell somebody who runs a supply chain, how would you like an AI application? They have no context for it. So what you'll see AI integrated into the use cases of the app into HR applications, into supply chain applications, et cetera. And all of these applications will begin to show examples of machine to machine learning as time goes on. 90% of all enterprise applications will figure AI capabilities and that may move faster. Next chart. I think this is gonna happen. Um, if you look at the ERP market for the reasons Mark described and that's one of many reasons why I was glad Mark could spend the time uh, here today. What you saw up here is, by the way, a very experienced, successful CEO. And you got to hear exactly from him how he thinks about IT, why he made the decisions he made. And you know the bases are pretty simple, right? What did he say? I don't want to customize. I wanted something that I could bank on Oracle something that would give me innovation, something that would help lower my costs. What did he talk about? Lowering audit fees, getting rid of spreadsheets, closing the books faster, better analytics. And I think that's the way most customers are gonna think. And they're gonna move, by the way, to a common back office. This theory, this point where I'm gonna buy all these applications as silos, that's why I wanted Mark to elaborate on that for a second. It's not the way the market's gonna move. People are gonna look not just to have the back office, HR and ERP, but frankly, all their applications with the ability to share information across all of those applications. And I think this could be bigger than ERP, frankly, because people, again, are not gonna move their complexity on premise to become their complexity in the cloud. They're gonna look for fewer players, not more players, more strategic partners to be able to make this happen. Okay. 
I'm not going to give you any more commercial. We're, I think companies are moving quickly. I think if this GDP story I told you way back 50 minutes ago, if this really pops, I believe the market will move faster. I believe it'll free up capital to invest long run to help companies flip this model. And so I think you're going to see this won't move, this movement to the cloud is not moving, you know, what you would think of as linearly, but I think moving more geometrically. That's what you're seeing in these predictions, which is what I said two and a half years ago of why I think I'm right, but where I'm wrong is on the slope of the line. The line's just going to move faster for all of the reasons that I've been through today. Okay, have a great rest of the conference. Thank you for the great energy you gave me while I was up here, all right, bye.